The story, Ingle Farm story, is a big part of my story. And actually, when I first moved to Australia from England, it was the Ingle Farm Corps that picked us up from the airport and housed us for six weeks until we got settled here. And uh, now we're officers on the, the Bellarine Peninsula. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's a very exciting calling uh, that, that uh, Di and I uh, are involved in. But I think it's more of a story um, than a, so much a calling. It's tapping into a story. And we're hearing throughout this whole weekend there's amazing stories. And God is telling an amazing story uh, of salvation. And he invites us to be part of that story. And for us as officers, um, Di and I got uh, appointed from training college to the, um, the Bellarine Peninsula, which on the next slide. As you'll see, it's uh, right near Geelong. Um, this is the Geelong region, that's the South Barwon region, and down here you have Torquay, then this is the Bellarine Peninsula. So we've got 13, 13 towns on, on the Bellarine Peninsula, and God, God sent us to this part of the world and uh, gave us the mandate of go and make disciples. And uh, that f was quite a scary thought for us. Go and make disciples. So we had a team of eight people that were given to us by the Salvation Army and they said, we're here to, you know, to um, support you in starting the core. And one of them said, we want you to be like the Geelong core. And one of you, want to, we want you to be like the South Barwon core. And another guy said, actually, we want you to be like the Torquay core. And we actually said, well, the Pete and Dye show is not really that great. Um, I can play a cornet and uh, hit the drums. We're not going to put on the Pete and Dye show. We're going to make disciples. And they all said, well, that's not going to work. And they left. So we said, okay. <laughs> and they went to those core. So we, we helped the core growth in that region. <laughs> but um, so we, what did that mean? What did it mean to make disciples? So for us, with our heritage um, coming out of Ingle Farm, obviously we're very much influenced uh, with being social as well as uh, spiritual, being together. And that's all I'm going to say on that debate because as far as I'm concerned, it is together and, and and, and that's all I'm going to say. But f so for us, it was connecting into God's story. Simply for us is connecting into God's story. And he was telling a story that was so obvious he was telling the story that we had 10 confirmations that we were going to be planting and not one of them came from the Salvation Army. God was making it very clear that he was telling the story and it was our role to tap into that story. And his story was simply what, what Brendan was articulated this morning is that we were to be those red doors in the community. We are to be people that build relationships with people in the community. Being the representation of Jesus in our community. So that is being people of integrity, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, being people who are patient, who are kind, who don't give up on other people. So we've been there for five and a half years and we just spent time. We're based here in Clifton Springs, but God, God kind of sent us out here to St. Leonard's. Um, through the Red Shield Appeal, we ended up at the St. Leonard's Primary School. And so Di and I went to St. Leonard's, we met a family there, and we, it wasn't safe to meet them in their home, so we met at the local school. Anyway, recently I discovered that the Salvation Army was on the Bellarine Peninsula from 1893 to 1899, and I didn't, I'd never heard of the Bellarine Peninsula. But it's funny how God is telling the story, because the story back then started the same as it did with us, and we didn't know this story. Two officers obediently went down to the St. Leonard's in 1893 and found a family, sat around the campfire, started to build relationships and the core on the Bellarine Peninsula started. Don't know why it closed in 1899, have no idea why it closed. But God was showing us that there's a story at work. He was showing us that we're tapping into his story and that the Salvation Army context is a, a vital part of his story because he speaks through context. So all we did was build relationships with people. And from that, programs appeared to emerge. And um, we have lots of different things that happen on the Bellowing Peninsula. It all looks like a lot of social programs, but it's actually people that we've connected with whose lives have found hope, trusting relationships. They've learned to trust us. And in that trusting relationship, 
they've learnt to function as a human being because they know that there's grace. They know that we're not going to quit on them. They know that, uh, that uh, they're not going to be judged. It is a safe place. So, and, and that's not a geographical location. It's wherever the follower of Jesus is. We take the presence and the message of Jesus with us into that community. So all these people that you see represented on here are people that we've connected with. And there's, there are some programs. Just Brass is a program that's started through some guys from the South Barwon Corps, which has been excellent. But everything else is, um, it appears to be a program. One of the biggest ones we have is, is Salvo Resto. It's a program but it doesn't cost us anything. It is, we were donated a, an EK Holden, and, and I'll just tell you this one story because we haven't got much time, but we were donated this, this EK Holden, and um, we, I just said, God, I don't know anything about cars. I'm absolutely useless. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't even fix one, let alone, or I can, can just about drive one. But, but we had um, this car, and for eight months, I'm like, what do we do with this car? You know, standard, Salvation Army practice has been, well, we better start a social program and restore the car. And I'm like, well, no, we, do, we don't have any money to do that. We're deficit funded already, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna get in that way. So one day I had my eyes gauged across a, a, an article in the paper and it said Auto Pro had put on a car show and I figured my simple mind, maybe I should go and speak to Auto Pro. And Auto Pro said, Actually, that's a great idea. We can't help you. Uh, just go up the road to the car detailing place. There's a guy there that might be able to help you. So I went up to him and saw this guy, Dave, and, and Dave said, that's a great idea. Come back tomorrow, I'm a bit busy. Anyway, so I went back the next day and I went back to Auto Pro because the main manager wasn't there. I just wanted to catch up with him this day. And the main manager said, sorry, I can't help you. So if I'd gone on that day, that would have been the end of the story. But I didn't go on that day. I went the previous day and got led back up the road. So I went to, with, uh, back up to see this other guy, Dave. And Dave said, you wouldn't believe this, but 10 minutes before you walked through the door yesterday, I was crying out to God. And you walked in the door. And he said, and he said come with me. So he, I went with him. And he had this big sign on the back of his workshop saying, I'm not the bleep Salvation Army. If you need support, go and see them. He was, he'd, he'd been burnt by helping others. And so I said, well, that's going to change, isn't it? Because you, know, you have to put up a proper sign. But anyway, his business has gone, has gone under. And we're still journeying with him. I saw him the other day. But he sent us across to the Smash Repairs. Now, the smash repairs, you may say, well, that's a logical choice to get a car restored. But I didn't want to go to the smash repairs because it didn't have a very good reputation. But God took us back to the smash repairs. And so that's where the story starts to become even more amazing because we get there and the guys are like, yeah, we'll help you. So they donate two hours or four hours a week of their time. So they're helping the community help four, four or five of these guys restore this EK Holden. So it looks like a social program where these boys are starting, you know, just involved in a program. This guy here, Cody, he's a junior soldier now. He, um, I was working with him at school and I didn't know much about his family story, but he was coming to our youth group on a Friday night. And he and Ethan up here love cars. So they're like, when are we going to work on this car? So while we were waiting for this eight months, every week they're like, when are we going to start this car? When are we going to start this car? So when we finally got them on board, we're starting this car. And they're like, great. So they got their friends to come as well. But I'm going to finish the story with this story of that. I got a message from Cody's mum about six months ago saying, you have no idea what you've done for my family. And I'm like, well, we haven't really done anything other than join a few dots. And, and she goes, no, my, you, don't, you don't know, but my um, father and I didn't have a great relationship when he died um, because he was at the Salvation Army in Colac and he was always there. And I hated him. He was like married to the Salvation Army. So they didn't have a very good relationship. And she said, um, 
but I've seen what you've done with my son and I'm just blown away by it. And then she goes, my father was also a panel beater. And now she's like, my father lives on in my son. He's doing the two things that my father loved. So you can see there's a powerful story of God is healing people who aren't even directly connected to the uh, program because they're getting caught up in the wonder of the story. And um, I just said back to her, well, I didn't know this stuff. Someone's telling the story. So for us, that's, that's just one story of many, many stories of lives that are being transformed. These guys that la last year got sent to the Australian Motoring Festival in um, Melbourne and um, they got to spend the weekend with Shane Jacobson and, and the, t the head of RACV. One afternoon it was pr pretty quiet and I said, well, don't just stand here and look pretty. Why don't you go and gave them a challenge? Just go to the other side of the exhibition hall and if you can get someone to come back here and show them through the program, I'll give you a prize. I'll buy you dinner. And I didn't think any of them would do it because they're all very cool. But they all wandered off and they came back. One guy, Cody, another Cody, he showed this guy around the car, gave a great presentation. We later discovered that he was the head of RACV for Victoria and went, wow, this is brilliant project. And all these boys have been put out of their comfort zone. But what's happened is by us going dependent on community, by us being part of this story that God is telling, God gets all the glory for it. People are stepping up, partnering in the mission with us. And lives are changing. And we, we call the project Salvo Resto simply because it's salvation and restoration is what we're about. So relationships are being restored. Not only is the car being restored, the reputation of the smash repairers is being restored. Their connection to wider people. Actually, on that same weekend, the Sunday morning of the Australian Motoring Festival, I was with the head of Mobile Australia. I didn't know. And he was telling me how crap his life was and how horrible his life was. And we were able to, I was able to pray with him in this auditorium and just so happened in the tradition of the Salvation Army, there was a guy, a couple of local performers just walking around the exhibition hall, one on sax and one on tuba, and they started playing Just a Closer Walk With Thee <laughs> at that very moment as we were just about to pray. And I'm just like, this is an amazing story. It's not something I've made up. It's something that God has invited me to be part of. And so for us on the Bellowing Peninsula, it might look like it's something that we have done, but all we've done is be obedient, listen to God and do what he says. And um, in the process of being obedient and letting go of our agenda, God gets all the glory and um, there's a wonder to it, like what you read in the New Testament. There's a lot of wonder and awe associated with it. So that's... That's just a small part of our journey, but that's it. Thanks, Peter and Diane. I've, I've met some of the people these guys have journeyed with, and uh, they're in there for the long haul, and you're building the kingdom of God. There's no doubt about that, and uh, it's very exciting what you're doing. And it's a new model in lots of ways for the Salvation Army. So we encourage you and uh, cheer you guys on too. Questions for Peter and Di? Tell us about this new model that you're using in the Salvation Army. It's an ancient model, actually. It's, a, it's, it's actually not a model at all. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a wonder that God has been involved in since the beginning of time and that he's telling this story. Uh, uh, people, yeah, it's like that whole priesthood of all believers pretty much is that um, we just jokingly say that actually we've been commissioned for nearly, what, six years or something and we haven't preached one sermon yet. So when we, when we gather and we have our gatherings together, we sit and we actually have open dialogue with our, with our people. So people would... 
they try to put us into like house church or organic church or whatever. We, prob- we probably don't try to label us as that, but um, it literally is just a missional community that is actually really realising that, you know, the church is in a crisis and I think it's actually, I'm probably a marginal in, in this, but I actually think it's a really good place for us to be because we actually have to look at ourselves and go, are we relevant? What are we here for? And there's lots of people out there who want to dialogue with us, so let's do that. And so the whole reason of our gatherings is actually pretty much um, one of the things for us is that pretty much our whole time we've been the only like um, Christians there. Like the others have all come to faith, so they've all been really small little seedlings. So uh, we have been the only real mature uh, Christians there, which has been great. But I mean that. Uh, is a challenge in itself as well, you know. Um, but that's good for us. So when we have our gatherings, um, it literally is to dialogue with these people. What does it mean to have faith? Who is Jesus? People don't even know who Jesus is. Like, and it, it literally is the biggest challenge for us when we first got there was actually having to go back to literally feeling like we're in Sunday school again, just even talking about basic, what is prayer? Why do we read the Bible? What is, who is even, like just stuff like that. So it's literally going back to grassroots, which is great, good stuff, I love it. Um, Is it a model that is best suited to the embryonic church? Um, um, In 15 years time, will you still use this model or will you be adaptable? Um, I think we, like one of the things when we first got there, and this is like any appointment, um, headquarters comes down and says, give us your five year plan and this business structure and you know, your set achievement goals and things like that. And um, we didn't really know. We just had been given this vision of, of how we needed to go and do it. But to, to quickly answer your question, we don't know what God, what God is going to do. We, we are just going to go with what you know, every day pretty much it is literally for us, just like a stepping out in faith of where God is. And, and we, are, we are literally falling through doors that he is opening for us. And five years ago to have envisaged that we would be in the place and have seen the lives transformed in the ways that they have and that we'd be doing ministries that we would never think of having done and we are totally unequipped like to be doing the ministries that we're doing. We can only say God has done this and uh, he has equipped us for the task, but more so we've actually empowered others to do the work that God has called him for. But I, I totally, but we were talking about this this morning, you know, even we had to get to a place where uh, I spoke to a spiritual director of mine and, and, um, and she said, Di, what happens if your core fails? What if when you leave, everyone leaves? Like, what if the Salvation Army ceases to exist on the Ballerine Peninsula when you leave? We have to believe also that God does have seasons for places. And that's something we have to come into a realisation for ourselves, that there, like, there are places that are seasonal. That doesn't mean to say we aren't. And I, I, like now, right now, we've got such a great team around us who, when we first came, weren't, weren't even Christians. So uh, we're preparing them for our departure and... They, we know that they will keep the flag flying for us when we leave. But, yeah. I was going to say, though, as, as far as the, the model goes, um, I would never change uh, the way I operate because it's, it's not so much a model. You're humanising and empowering a human being. So the, relation, the idea of disciple-making is being a person that humanises someone, being a person that empowers someone and taps them into the story of God and as they are um, in that story of God, they are then empowered to go and do what God is calling them to do. So that can work in any context. If we are sent to an established core, um, it, uh, tra- well, traditionally, this, this way of uh, disciple making in an established setting is that the people within an established setting have not necessarily been accustomed to the culture of having to go and do something as John said this morning, in the last 30 years, it's been more about just come and sit. So for us in an existing congregation, it would be working with those who we discover who are open to this idea of um, 
going on this journey and empowering them and supporting them to do whatever it is God is calling them to do. So it could be if we were sent here, you, there might be one person in this community that's empowered to go and start working with a, another local community uh, or, or just start connecting with a family nearby. And as that family starts to connect into the story of God, they're, they're experiencing healing, they're experiencing justice, dignity, pay, you know, they're experiencing that reality. As they change, that has a chain reaction to the people that know them. So it's kind of in allowing that process to happen. And it may not happen depending on whether they respond. So it's basically finding that person of peace. The model is really is, is what is, is, is seen in the life of Jesus but is articulated in Luke 10. 